الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وآله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله في البدء أشكر الإخوة الكرام في المكتب التعاوني للدعوة لشهادة توعة الجاليات في أبها على التحضير والتجهيز والتنسيق لهذه الدورة المباركة التي يسمونها هم ضوابط دعوة غير المسلمين وأنا أسميها اللغة الإنجليزية في خدمة الإسلام وعلى رأسهم شيخنا وأستاذنا حبيبنا الدكتور عبد الله بوشي In the beginning I thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for being here you and me Secondly I thank our colleagues and brothers headed by our colleague and mentor my, he's my mentor, Dr. Abdullah Bouashi, and all those people who really, uh, men and women, do their work for the sake of da'wah to make this program successful, which I call it English for the Service of Islam. I thank you all for taking some of your precious time, although you're investing in your time, uh, to attend this session and other sessions. Uh, I usually run my sessions in a workshop form. However, the setting of this hall is not really appropriate for that. You'll be sitting most of the time, I'll be moving most of the time. I wanted it to be vice versa. But in such a situation, I won't be able to do so. <clears throat> this is my, uh, what do you call it, repeated topic, but I see different faces. So it's not repeated to you which is a topic of great importance for people who make da'wah, whether it's with English or with any other languages. And when I was making wudu before I came here, I was thinking of this background. Are you with me? Yes. Who's asleep? Nobody? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, of this background, and I said, I should have changed the background. It's been there for three years. Do you see any relationship between the background and the topic? You know, the background is very beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? Is there a relationship between the background and the topic? No. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, interesting. You see how people look at things differently? Somebody said there is no relationship okay, between the topic and the background. <laughs> Somebody saw a relationship. Anybody else? Yes, you have to accept the misconception about Islam. Uh, really, and you have to present Islam uh, with uh, nice faces. Excellent. You've got to be an open-minded, just like a beautiful flower. Everybody gets a smell, even if people disagree with it. It still smells good. The fragrance is beautiful. Okay? He's, ha he's having another. Yes, brother. Whenever someone accuses Islam of something, this makes uh, more people embrace Islam. So, it's, uh, so more bees come to the. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. It's, uh, these are the flowers of the different colors. In this different color, they get a different smell. Then it becomes a wonderful bee. So he gives a one combined smell. Allah. Of Islam. Of Islam. Different different thinking, but at the end of the day, they become same man. Interesting. Interesting. Mashallah. Alaykum. Alaykum assalam. I think if we can avoid the misconceptions, then it will be better. Beautiful. So the misconceptions work as a veil between people and the beauty of Islam. Jazakallah khair. Our sisters, you have something to say? No? Okay, the men are taking the ground. Uh, this is an issue I've been always thinking. Why should we talk about misconceptions? Uh, first of all, I've got to say something. Don't give da'wah. Don't give da'wah through misconceptions. What do you think? Huh? I think there's just as many Muslims that have misconceptions as there are non Muslims. <laughs> Allah uh, you know what uh, Brother Yahya is saying, that there are some Muslims that are having misconception, probably more than some Muslims. 
So it is an, an inevitable issue. We cannot avoid it. It's reality. It's reality. Who started the first misconception in this universe, this world? Iblis. Iblis, you're right. You see? Even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Iblis raised the first misconception. So, the misconception are satanic sometimes. <coughs> Issues brought to stop, to work, to stand on the way of people, between the, the, in the way of people to understand Islam. What else? Who, who could really define to me what is meant by misconceptions? In a very simple manner, misconceptions. Yes, brother. Misconception is a distortion of understanding. And he said misconception means misunderstand. We'll see. Get him very close. Yes, it's my brother raised his hand first. Go ahead. I like bold guys because I'm bold myself. Okay. Wrong interpretation. Wrong interpretations. Okay. Brother here. Yes. Um, there is no the truth is not clear. The truth is not clear. Could be. Thought or idea or uh, misunderstanding of uh, a story from uh, the prophet's traditions uh, or uh, of a verses in Quran that makes uh, people feel that life has uh, stayed of the truth or the original. This is a lecture. This is a lecture. Okay, you're doing it on my behalf. <laughs> okay, my colleague. <laughs> yes. yes, because this uh, who has a misconception about Islam comes from another religion with another background and some different principles. So if you take it, Brother Yahya's uh, initiative, it could come from a Muslim or a Muslim. It's a misconception. But he will talk about the, those used by non-Muslims. Yeah. Right. Yeah, my brother. Thinking about Islam, such things, what actually Islam is not. Okay. Thinking of what? About Islam in a way which is not. Okay. So now we have a number of definitions. But we could come up with a conclusion that this misconception is a wrong idea raised about Islam. No matter what that is, it's a concept, which is not true. Uh, let me see, go to my slides and see what I still have, if I still remember them, you know, over time. So I have an outline for you here. What we started with, which is, who could read it for me? <coughs> Misconceptions it refers to incorrect interpretations of our understanding regarding a certain issues. It could be any issue. Now, we take issue, we put it, put Islam. Put Islam. This is in general. Since sometimes misconceptions are not only about religions, it could be about food. You know, my kids, they didn't like, they had misconceptions about eggs. And they didn't want to eat them. For a long time, whenever my wife would boil eggs for them, they wouldn't eat eggs. And she realized that they had misconceptions about eggs. You know what she did? She started coloring eggs in a different way. So they started eating. It's not the egg. It is the conception that you have about the egg that drove you away from it. So she was really, she did a technique which I think was uh, interesting as well as uh, smart. Okay. Uh, I just talked about uh, the first incident of misconceptions that took place in this universe, in, in the upper universe. And my brother said it was with Shaitan. How about in our current times, contemporary times, who usually raise misconceptions? Non-believers. Non-Muslims in general? Yeah. Okay. Who else? It, now we go from general to specific. Yes, then Muslims might raise some conceptions, but there are other categories of people. Yes, my brother? Jews. Jews. Enemies of Islam. Yeah. Enemies of Islam. Muslims or Orientalists. Orientalists. Let's uh, ask a question. Are all misconceptions raised by enemies of Islam? No. 
You, as a good Muslim, sometimes a misconcept will come to your mind and you need to clarify it. So, this is part of dealing with misconceptions with open mindedness. Sometimes we think only enemies, and for bad purpose, people raise these misconceptions. I'll, I'll tell you something. We had a number of uh, 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 American military men who visited our center of Hamis, I think two years back. Colonel and a general, I guess. Those very influential people, and they came to visit. <coughs> they were invited. A special invitation was given to them to come. And we started really talking about the weather, the food, the clothes, all these things that neutral to some extent. I realized we got to get into the get into the topic. Then I spoke to one of them and said, What do you think of Islam? <coughs> he smiled just like he smiled, with a big smile, and he was trying to avoid. What answer do you think he gave to me? What answer he gave to me? But I, I mean, no, he just said it in one word. So just, just one yes. word. Yes. Terrorism. Terrorism. <laughs> Terrorism. Well, what I did, I slapped him on that. <laughs> <laughs> This is, you cannot blame people for developing such ideas because we'll find out later on how misconceptions take place. But then, I don't think that in this very short time, one and a half hour, one to an hour and 20 minutes, that we'll go, I'm just going to talk about, you know, this is what I'm trying to, the outcome of this kind of workshop, they call it workshop, is to develop some idea of what misconcepts are, how they come about, who brings them out and how to deal with them. In general, then we'll take one example, probably. Because there are many, every day, you get new ones. And this is why if you look at Pepsi-Cola, they play with their colors, they play with their logos, every time. Why? They change. They clarify misconceptions, all misconceptions. And they market their product in the most beautiful way. One time market, it's the same thing, the same content, the same excellent content. Do you agree with me? Perhaps you call it excellent content? You like that? Okay, so, but they keep dealing with them. They, you think they change the product? No. But they, they play different methods of marketing it. This is why PepsiCola is one of the most successful companies in the world in marketing. And probably they pay more than anybody for marketing. The product is the same. For a long time has been the same. Are we dealing with Islam as PepsiCola does? Okay. Uh, so look at this is a very general history of misconceptions in, 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 in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi You know, the people of Quraysh raised many ideas. When we die and become dust, are we going to be resurrected? They said this to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is only this life. We just live and die. So, the Jews of Medina started raising many issues and they asked questions to the Prophet ﷺ. And Surah Al-Kahf is a very good evidence for that. The Christians of Najran, when they came to the Prophet ﷺ, they came to him in his masjid in Medina and see how he dealt with them. Then philosophers, orientalists, Arabs. This will take us to go, I don't know what's wrong with this. It's supposed to, be, to come one by one. I exposed myself to you. But you are intelligent enough to answer without looking at that. Is that true? Why? Okay. Sources of contemporary misconceptions about Islam. Some of you have already mentioned some. 
So they're not reading the Sirah and etc. MashaAllah alaykum. Misinformation. I could be misinformed. I don't have wrong intentions. I'm just misinformed. Somebody told me that Muslims are terrorists. You say, Brother Maxwell, you're my neighbor? I had a Muslim neighbor. And that Muslim neighbor was very bad, lying all the time. See? And it started, so Islam must be a religion of liars. You see? So I gave him misinformation, an incident that I had with others. Or I saw something in the media. I read a book. Somebody told me something. So I became misinformed. Behavior of some. We usually blame others, but we don't usually blame ourselves. Even Shaitan in the day of judgment will come. Don't blame me, blame yourselves. And there's something very important that you get to realize. Okay? That our behavior is one of the most important sources of misconceptions about Islam. Who agrees with me on this? Who agrees? that the behavior of some Muslims is one of the main sources of misconception about Islam. Yes. Who disagrees with me? So this is the question. You see, people not get too, too voting, okay? So who disagrees with me? 100 percent? MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Okay? I didn't expect that because there is a room for disagreement. Oh, yes, you disagree with me, Dr. Dawood? Yeah, behavior of some Muslims. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it depends on uh, people, if they are Muslim or non-Muslims, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, it might be the behavior of some Muslims to non-Muslims is okay, acceptable. But for the Muslims, it's not. Okay. No, I'm just talking about the source of contemporary misconception about Islam. This is one sort. You're right. Could be. Yeah. But our behavior as Muslims sometimes... It's not pretty, you know, uh, yes, yes. People don't really think about that, you see. This is... Now you think rationally, okay? Just like you see a Christian behaving in such a way, you say, all Christians are bad. You see, Christianity must be a new religion. You see? It's two way. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about when I say, no, this is one man who mistreated me. Doesn't mean that all those people are bad. You see? But, uh, this is rational. They call it rational thinking. Cons misconceptions are not rational, are not based on rational thinking, based on perceptions, conceptualization. Okay? Uh, Orientalist, and you know the Orientalist, Mr. Shri Paul. They have wrote a lot about Islam a long time, even some of the contemporary ones. You know, could you name some of the contemporary Orientalists? They don't call themselves Orientalists anymore. I'll tell you why. They don't call themselves Orientalists anymore. Those Orientalists, the people who, you know, Orient, the world Orient means the East, studying the East, but it means studying Islam and Muslims. And most of the studies were written about that. So, uh, can you name one or two or three Orientalists? You know, people who write about Islam and speak about Islam and think that they call them experts on Islam nowadays. They call them experts. They don't call them Orientalists anymore. You know some of these names? Edward Said. Uh, Edward Said? I don't think Edward Said was Orientalist. He was the one who wrote the book called Orientalism. And after that book was written, it was published in 1970-something, the Orientalists used to be very proud of themselves. Say, what are you doing? Say, I'm an Orientalist. Okay. After that book was published, say, I am Orientalist. But because he exposed their methods, although he was not a Muslim. It was Said, a uh, Palestinian American, a uh, Christian, who died a few years back. Okay. A uh, very well known, influential figure. You know some of the people nowadays who write about Islam? Salman Rushdie. Salman Yeah. Have you heard of Thomas Friedman? Yes. Who else? Noam um, Chomsky. No, I don't think he's a realist. But. Okay, so there are many who write nowadays about Islam, men and women, in journalism and media, and they have become a source for that. Motivated journalists, this is, we talked about one of them. And missionaries, you know missionaries? Okay. Have you met a missionary in your life? Only here. Huh? Here? The, Only here, yes. Yeah, you met them here, not in the States. Yeah, there are many here. Don't think. Uh, I'll give you an example. Allahumma salli ala I met 
one in the state, many in the states, okay, and some here, okay, some here. When we first came, uh, a friend of mine, my roommate, when we first went to the States, probably the first, second two, two weeks, we didn't realize that the missionary was living upstairs. He came down to us with the, call them Bible hoppers, with the Bible. He started speaking with us. He was a young man, our age at that time. I was 23 at that time, or 22. So he was our age, and he was talking with us, sat in the sofa, and he threw the Bible on the, on the ground. And he said, this is the book that takes you to heaven. We looked at it, and he started pointing with his toe. I looked at Saud. I said, what do you think this man is doing? He said, it must be nuts. We're talking about that in Arabic. يمكن خبر. رجال خبر. كيف يجيب كتابه ويرميه في الأرض ويقول يدعونا بالكلجل هيديدة. How can you call to the book that you think it's the book of Allah brings people to paradise? You throw it in the ground and you point to it with your... I said, if you would do that to the Quran, I'll kick something I will not tell you. He used to say at that time. <laughs> then the man was surprised. He said, you cannot do it. We respect the Bible more than you do. So we started clarifying misconceptions with this man. He became a friend of mine later on. Then he didn't become a Muslim and didn't become a Christian. But we kept being close neighbors and we had contact with each other. Ignorance. And I think there is a lot. He pointed at Okay. Ignorance. There are many people who don't really know Islam and will be responsible for Allah in front of Allah. Many work with us. Work with Muslims for a long time. I remember somebody who worked in Paris for 16 years. He was a, from, from Thailand, a Thai. Imagine how Allah brought him to the center one day. Although we were located downtown. And he's been working for 16 years. So, when he became Muslim, I asked him, what made you to become Muslim? He said, come on, I've been here for 16 years. Nobody spoke with me about Islam. They spoke about everything, good or yeah. bad. But nobody mentioned Islam to me. I don't know how I came here. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought me. You see? But sometimes uh, we don't. Don't think that everybody knows about Islam. There is a lot of misconception. Don't everybody think that everybody will go and pick the Quran and read it. Don't think that every Muslim will take a book about Islam and just read it. Or will go and buy a, a CD or a table or go to a website. They would hardly do that. Nobody would do that. Very few would do that. It's a very a tiny minority who would do that because of interest for one reason or another. Okay? And respect of our sisters here, I want to talk about some of the things that would drive most people to know about Islam and find out about Islam. Unfortunately, it's not always the right approach or the right topic or the right reason that brings those people to, to know about Islam. So we need to approach people and clarify what they have in their minds. You know, atheists, some Muslims claim they're Muslims in the reality. Any questions you have about something you want to add to what is mentioned? My, my lists are not exclusive. My lists are not exclusive. Yes, my brother. About the uh, missionaries, you said uh, some of them here in Saudi. Oh. <laughs> no, no, don't be surprised. One is a da'i who's, you know Ahmed Amin? Who knows Ahmed Amin? Ahmed Amin used to be a missionary. He used to have his open church in Sudan. But I'll tell you a story. You remember the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا ثُمَّ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسْرَةً ثُمَّ يُغْلَبُونَ This is just a reflection of this ayah. That the non-believers will spend their money to prevent people from They will spend their money. And they will be defeated. Ahmad Amin is a good example. Anyway, uh, we had a, a brother, his name is, I forget his first name, his uh, previous name. Uh, still, his name now is Sultan, Sultan Selim Gahai. You know, who knows Sultan Selim Gahai here? Yeah. Very good physiotherapist, okay? So he, he his, his, I think, father was American, or his grandfather. American Marines, when they went to the Philippines and they get married there. Anyway, so uh, Sultan went into what they call them, these missionary schools, but they have, uh, they call it a parallel program. Parallel, parallel program. You go study uh, physiotherapy and you go at night to get a diploma in the church. So you get a double degree, double degree. And you get smart, intelligent, hardworking, poor young men and women. They take them into these programs. They take them into these programs. So he graduated. This is in the Philippines. And got a double degree and they will go into human resources offices you know recruiting and they will help those people they pay more for those people to go to this country why he's going to work with young people the sports sportif okay athletes okay and they need him his english was good his manners were good very well trained so he came here before he came to this country they warned him against somebody. There's somebody in Saudi Arabia, we don't know where he is. His name is, was Ricardo Manansella. Be aware of him. Who knows Ricardo Manansella? Who knows Ricardo Manansella? You don't know? You know Ricardo Manansella? Okay. okay. So, subhanAllah. Ahmed Amin, you know, he used to do shish kebab, you know? He loves it good. Have you eaten some? I mean, he cooks. He loves it. Okay? Those are our brothers. They're not blood brothers, but they are our brothers in Islam. That we love them more than our own blood brothers. Anyway, Ahmed Amin used to go to the place where he used to work. I spoke to him for some time about Islam and these things. The man is starting asking me. Big questions because he was well versed on Christianity, very well trained. So Ahmed Hamim was having a hard time with him. But he accepted the challenge because when you, become, you want to become a da'i, you get to accept the challenge for two reasons. One, you follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad in the best way possible. Second, you expect hurdles in your way. So what happened? This man became Muslim and he gave the name to himself, chose the name. Sultan, Sultan Selim Gahai. After that, he revealed his story, the purpose for which he came. And he said, I wish I could see this Ricardo and Sella that they warned me against. They have been warning him. Be careful of Ricardo and Sella. You know who Ricardo and Sella was? Ahmed Amin, the man who called him to Islam. He became Muslim without knowing that this man was Ricardo Ben Salah, because everybody was calling him Ahmed Amin. Ahmed Amin. This is there are many examples. The whole evening we'll talk about examples of those people. We found a tailor, Shadat al Khamis. Okay, a tailor who was a priest, a missionary. Okay, they call them uh, tent makers. Shadat Okay, tent makers. Have you heard of tent makers? Heat beverages. Tint makers, the phones. Who makes tints in the whole world? Who? We, the Bedouins, Hanif Bedouins, They get the name from us. But those people who work among us doing different jobs, but in reality they do missionary work. We found some in Asir hospitals, big consultants. Okay, yes. Allahumma salli ala wa So we have something to add here. Can you stand up for one minute? Can you stand up? 
While you're standing up, I'll sit down. MashaAllah. Make the speech, Ya Khan. Salam ala Rasulullah. I see, um, my mother used to tell me, Abdullah, uh, because I was the oldest among my brothers and sisters, and three died after me, so I became a, a good babysitter. Okay? <laughs> I make people sleep easily. Yeah? So I go, have a seat. Uh, I wanted to smile. Uh, this is the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not a surah, it's not a surah. Okay? So you don't have anything to say. I'm sure you have nothing to say. You have something to say? No. I challenge you to say anything. You see? <laughs> yeah, atheists include those people. I mean, uh, the people who have secular thinking. Either they have secular thinking or they didn't believe in Allah. But the difference between secularism and atheism that sec secularists, they could be atheists and they may not be atheists, but they think that religion has nothing to do with life. Religion has nothing to do with life. While atheists, they don't think of the, the, no religion exists. There is no God at all. Okay? They don't believe in the existence of God at all. Okay? Allahumma salli ala So, I think, uh, yes. Methods of refute to misconceptions. We know now, we understand what misconception is. Some of the Islam is a terrorist religion. Islam abuses women. Islam is a religion of slavery. Allah is God moon. These are all uh, Muslims are savage. Okay? Islam is savage. They even went to the to the extent that they claim that Muhammad وسلم, was a terrorist. Himself. They will go ne next step they will say Allah is. We will see. The, the Jews have insulted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more than that, okay, even the Christians, they say, they say Allah is having a son. This is the biggest insult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will say this to Allah. Wait, if they have not said it, said it, okay? They talked about the Quran and said this is book of terrorism. And they burn it. All these misconceptions are raised and turn into action sometimes. Based on these mis misconceptions, they started acting. And there is a difference when you develop a misconception about this man when I start beating him, see, this is he's my enemy. If I don't beat him, he'll go on to. And this is what's happening with Islam in the world. Okay? And I don't realize that this man is very peaceful. He was one of my students. Huh? I'm very pleased to see you like some. Uh, they are not my students anymore. They are my colleagues, and I learned from them a lot. I learned a lot from them when they were at the university, and I learned a lot from them now. Okay? Allahumma salli ala sallam. Salli ala nabi. We looked at the sources of misconceptions. Some sources we could really stop. We could minimize. Some we can't. Some, they've got to be there. Allahumma salli ala sallam. Here, let's look how to refute, I mean, how to deal with misconceptions. How to deal with misconceptions. Let me ask you a question. I think you can hear me without the mic, can you? What if I get dry throat? Who has dealt with some of these misconceptions? Who had, has been through the experience that somebody spoke to him and I said, I think this way about Islam. This way about Islam. Who has been in such, such an experience to refute, to deal with some of these misconceptions? Yes, Bill. Yes, in my college experience or in my college life, I have been uh, studying or learning on those three thousand languages. Uh -huh. So they, they were uh, always asking me, is that your religion being for, against, against Yes. Yes. 
Okay, they think that Islam prohibits enjoyment of this life. Brother Umar. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, now I want somebody. Now, halas. Another question. Okay. Now I want somebody who has been in such a situation where misconcepts were raised to him, but he was able to clarify and would tell us how he clarified. Mother Teresa. Yeah, she did a lot, a lot of good jobs in India as far as from missionary. Mm -hmm. But she d doesn't have iman. She, uh, but my brother was telling, he was, she was doing so many good jobs. So inshallah, <coughs> she go to Jannah like this. <laughs> then I tried to tell him, my brother, let's see, he's having, she's having so many good jobs she has, but she doesn't have iman. So okay. She didn't believe a lot at this one. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Interesting. Abu Talib was doing a much better job to the Prophet ﷺ than Mother Teresa. Okay, anybody else? Could you tell us about your experience? I've been all of these at one time and I don't memorize them. Just one. Just one experience, real life experience. Brother Yahya has been doing a lot of da'wah, may Allah reward him. Allah blessed him to be a Muslim. Now we learn from him about Islam. <coughs> Probably the same military people that you were talking to came to see me first. And they said the same thing to me, that all Muslims are terrorists. And why I, did you become a Muslim? And I told him, I said, did you really think about what you said? There's one and a half billion Muslims in the world. If we're all terrorists, tomorrow the world is finished. You're all gone. So we can't all be terrorists. And in the, in the end, he said, no, oh, he says, you're right. It's just one instance. There's many. Thank you, Brother Rahim. You see, a very simple. Explanation. Sometimes people need simple, very simple response. They don't need a lecture. Some say Muslims are terrorists. Say that Muslim, all Muslims were terrorists as you think. 1.6 billion people terrorists in the world. In three minutes, the whole world will. Nothing left but Muslims. And uh, yes. Actually, before I told him that, I told him that it was a misconception. Person saying that we were all terrorists, his English was not good, he meant tourists. Tourists. <laughs> uh, this is an, another interesting uh, form of misconception, which is linguistic, we call it malrepresentation. Malrepresentation. Let's look at this. You see, uh, somebody else would like to say something, Ikhwan Asif, if you had, but you take an, an example and how he responded to him. Yes. Yeah, so. uh, I remembered when I went to sabbatical again to the States, things changed a lot. I went there in 1985. And, I start, and yeah, there were some misconceptions, but now they have escalated. 
So I met somebody, an American friend of mine at the university. Now I came, I went, I was a student. Now I came to the same place as a visiting professor. <coughs> so I met uh, one colleague. We started with each other's talking. And I said, I want to make what the next thing. He said, but please don't do that. I said, why? <laughs> he said, haven't you watched, watched the film Jihad in America? I said, no. Before doing every terrorist act they make, well, so they, made mis they focus on that. They do it. They depict. They call it depiction. Covering Islam through depiction. They focus on certain acts, and they relate it to exploding an airplane. OK? Making wudu means exploding. This is when you start talking about that. So they, they really re-emphasize this. They make depiction. They market it. They, you know, when, when you lie to somebody many times, even you lie to himself, you, they call it the make belief. You remember Alice in the, Holly, in, in the Wonderland? The, you make belief. You make belief. It's not real, but you make yourself you believe that it is. Uh, after some time, just like they did with Pepsi Cola, the choice of the new generation. You still remember? The choice of the new generation. They continued with that. Now they change it over time. People don't believe it anymore. Because the new generation that you have, they've been talking about has become an old generation they talk about. Uh, so we deal with misconceptions in many ways through Quran. But if you talk to this uh, comrade I mean this uh, uh, colonel in the American army who came to you and asked you about something, and I said, the Quran said this. Would he accept that from you? Why? He doesn't believe in the Quran. OK? But there are incidents in the Quran that took place that clarify misconceptions. Can you pinpoint at least one of them? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran was clarifying misconceptions. <coughs> yes. لو كان فيهما آلهة إلا الله لفسدتا. If there were other gods beside Allah, this world will. You see, another place in the Quran. Allah is speaking to them. Say, okay, there are many gods. Why only Allah? And even the Christian today, they didn't realize many of them, some of them, not all of them. That some there are some called Unitarian Christians. You know, Unitarian Christians had kalaf al-masani here in you know what Unitarian Christians are? Could you just, in one minute, Brother Yahya? They still believe in one God and they don't believe Jesus and the Son of God. They don't believe in the original sin. They took my booklet, the original sin, and they put it in their website. So sometimes we share belief with others. But because we don't know about them, we don't know how to deal with them. All Christians are not the same. All Christians, hundreds of denominations. And sometimes you speak for half an hour about something, they say, I don't believe in that. Because they don't know about their background. So, Am Khuliku min Gayri Shayin, Am Hum Khalikun, Am Khalaku Samawati wal Ard, Bel, La Yukun. Allah is speaking to them because they deny the existence of God. Say, did they create themselves? Were they created from nothing? Did they create the universe? So, all responses will be, then who? Okay. So, there are incidents, the Quranic verses that deal with such issues. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the minds of those people with logical explanations that they will focus, trying to challenge them, challenge their own rationale. So, incident from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Can you remember just one incident in the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There are many conceptions raised in his time. We want to go to Iftar, you know, oh, we still have plenty of time. Oh. I got exhausted, I thought the time has passed already. Don't you think, can't you think of any incident in life of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, where he clarified some misconcepts? But this will instigate our thinking. 
when an old woman came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said لا تدخل الجنة عجوز an old woman would not get into paradise she was very sad and she left with tear in her eyes but the Prophet وسلم, was saying that with a smile with a smile he said come come all the people of paradise will be young. Okay? And if, if you look how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with the Jews, and there is a very interesting incident in how to... Uh, uh, let me ask a question, first of all. Is clarifying misconception da'wah strategy or not? Is it a da'wah strategy to go to people and say, Oh, you say that uh, ter Islam is terrorism. Thank you. I was saying something. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, the Jews had many, many concepts about Islam. And he took, had to clarify them. And they were spreading these misconceptions among the people of Medina. That Muhammad is a liar. Yeah, that Muhammad is a liar. And one way, one of the best ways to clarify misconceptions is through actions. As the British say, they actions speak louder than words. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina and he saw the people fasting the day of Ashura tomorrow. Okay, look how the Prophet ﷺ was investing on time, environment, incidents. He said, why are you fasting this day? He said, we fast this day because Allah granted victory to Prophet Moses. And they say Moses, as, prophet, as if Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was not a pro Prophet Moses over the Pharaoh. Look how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used this situation for da'wah purposes. He said, Musa, Moses is very much related to us more than he is related to you. We'll start fasting that day. But differently from you, we'll fast the day before it or after it. And sometimes one action would really, really take away, refute all these misconceptions. And if you go to the life of Prophet Muhammad in Mecca and other places, and, uh, and how he dealt with the people of Najran, the, Jew, I mean the, the Christians of Najran, uh, you realize that the seerah is full of incidents that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to refute misconceptions. Sacred writings of different groups. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? For each, this is what said sacred writings, not only sacred books, okay? Every religious denomination, they have their own sacred books, like the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, for the, the, the Hindus, the Vedas, and uh, uh, the Buddhists, the Mormon book. I mean, all these different. Sometimes you find something there. They talk about, and they don't realize that exists there. Can you give example of the misconceptions that Christians raise about Islam and Muslims, and their teachings support the Muslims, not their own misconceptions? Today I don't have my Bible with me, but I'll try to. Yeah, get, get it. <laughs> yeah. But my, my Bible is marked. Yours is marked as well. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. So some, there are some misconceptions that Christians raise about Muslims and Islam. It's here. It's here. This is one method. Could you name some? Could you say some? Jazakallah khair. 
since you're ready. Alhamdulillah, I have an, not a sister, but a teacher here today. They ask us why we don't eat pork in their books if they cannot also. Okay, what is in their book, please? Leviticus 11, 7 says, And the swine don't divide the hooves, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cut is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcass you shall not touch, they are unclean to you. They are unclean, even you don't touch them. This is the first thing that you, when you get with American friends or non-American, I mean Christians, they eat pork a lot. And the Filipinos like uh, chops. Okay? They tell them, you don't eat it. Huh? I always get asked why I have a long beard. Aha. Uh-huh. In their book, in Leviticus 19.27, says you shall not shave around the sides of your head, meaning their hair should be round like ours. And you shall not disfigure the edges of your beard, means you can't trim it at all. Again, please, more. You shall not shave around uh, are, are you listening, Yehwan? says, you shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. Talking about trimming. And then they have many tattoos and stuff, and they ask why we don't. It says, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. When you get when the people die, you shall not make marks. I want you to refer to an incident. For example, I mean, like, uh, these are very culturally uh, related issues because they see how you look, they smell you, they see what you eat, what you dress. But let's go to the belief that people have, okay? One of the issues that like uh, Catholicism is based upon it is crucifixion. And why crucifixion? You know crucifixion? Salt. Why crucifixion? They see, they usually claim that Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sins on the cross for whose sin he's dying who started this sin but he read something for you that refutes this within the old testament the original sin okay. do you have something there the father shall not die for the son and the shall, uh, son shall not die for the father it is the one who sinned who should die it's there uh, when you speak to this, usually people don't raise it's only missionaries with their misconceptions. I call them superficial misconceptions, like why you wear a beard, or why you dress like this, why you don't eat like that, why you don't behave like that. And this is what people usually say. <coughs> They're superficial, okay? Because this is what they see. But there are some what they think uh, more <coughs> in depth misconceptions about Islam, like belief. Okay? When you speak to people, it has become a firm belief that Jesus died for our sins, according to some of the Catholic Christians. So the original sin is something that they believe in. It's very strong. If, you, if it does not exist, then the issue of Jesus as the Son of God should not be taking place as well. You, have, you want to say something? I don't use this. I use the book of Genesis where it said that Adam and Eve committed their sin and God forgave them. Mm-hmm. But then Jesus came in the New Testament to save them from that sin. But in Genesis, it says, says forgive. They were already forgiven. That's true. That's true. Adam and Eve both. Adam will till the soil for the rest of his life for his sin, and Eve will scream in childbirth for their sin. Well, if Jesus came and saved them, why was my mother screaming when I was born? <laughs> Interesting. And I guarantee yours was too. That's true. That's true. May Allah reward them. This is why paradise is underneath the feet of our mothers. Okay, so let me ask a question. It just, is it always good to take the Bible around and start preaching Islam through using the Bible? If you know it. This is one thing. But let's say, do I have to? It's, it's very important that some of us think that there can never be da'is for non-Muslims unless they know the Bible very well. Yes, you want to say something, brother? Prophet Muhammad taught Islam without reading the Old That's true. That's true. But when there is a mean to achieve that, I mean, for a good purpose. So we don't need to have the Bible around. We don't have to be well-versed in the Bible to give da'wah. Because all the companions of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, most of them, didn't need to. And they had no or little knowledge about the Bible. They were not warned by the Prophet ﷺ because that was at the beginning of da'wah. And this religion has to be 
perfect it, and complete it. And the Quran has to be perfected in the form it is, not to uh, use uh, Torah or Injil, although it exists in Torah at that time because of the Jews of Medina. And this is an issue that I want to emphasize, that don't think that you can be a good da'i for Islam among non-Muslims without full knowledge of the Bible or even using the Bible because people, most people know nothing about Islam. They need to know what the word Islam means in the right way. Just like we did with this many, many educated Westerners, terrorism. They don't know what Islam is. If you, many of the misconceptions that are raised are simply, can simply be answered. I met many people and they say, Islam is the religion of the Arabs. No, in Africa it's the religion of the Hausa. When you say you're Hausa in Africa it means that you are Muslim. Okay? And many of the Hausa are not Muslims. And many, most Muslims of Africa are not Hausa. Are not Hausa. And these are misconcepts that are raised. And they, when you say somebody, say, no, it's not true. Islam is not the religion of the Arabs only. People from all over the world say, yeah, come on. When you tell them that the Arabs only make 20, 30% of Muslims, they don't believe you at the first time. Unless you prove that to them. Say, this is the map of the Muslim world. This is Kazakhstan. This is Indonesia. This is Malaysia. This is India. This is Pakistan. This is Bangladesh. This is Nigeria. This is Ghana. This is, huh? That is, and you talk to, oh, then they, and I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and always we say that, that Islam is the most misunderstood religion. And it is the most talked about religion. It's the most talked about religion, and it is the most misunderstood religion. It's not only that. It is the most represented, unrepresented religion, unfortunately. Because people of Islam, how many Muslims there are in the United States? People say, somebody say, there are only a bunch of guys just sending back to their homes. Somebody say, no, there are 10 millions, depending on, on what's your background and what you want to achieve. But you know, that every town in the States you find a mosque. Have you been to a town where you didn't find a mosque? In hidden places, like in, in Nevada or, uh, <laughs> okay? But I'm talking populated states. You hardly find a place. I, I even went with a colleague once in, in England, and every time of Salah, Asr, Dhuhr, we pray in a different masjid in Jama'ah. Different masjid in Jama'ah. But where are we? What have we done to clarify all these misconcepts about Islam? Once I went with a taxi driver when I first went to London, and I spoke to him about Islam and things like that. He said, oh, Muslims must be very nice. He looked at me. They don't usually look back at you, but it's, it's kind of, are you <laughs> in your full senses? And he starts speaking about Muslims in a very negative way. Way with his first hand experience. First hand experience. And when you have misconceptions from first hand experience, these are very effective. They're very hard to remove. Anyway, let's move. Uh, uh, science, uh, logic. And the Quran used logic with those people. Do you have examples where you can use logic to clarify some misconceptions? Can you think? Yes, sister. Could you raise your voice so I can hear you? Yeah. 
وضرب لا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم اوكي okay. anything else i'll give you a story that took place during the time of the sahaba once upon a time uh, the, the, when the, the muslims um, were spreading all over the world and among them were the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu They passed by a monastery in Jordan. They passed by a monastery. You know monastery? Okay, so Okay. Then the monk came down right, to them. Say, where did you come from? He said, we came from Medina. He said, do you have among you any of the companions of Muhammad? Allahumma salli alayhi wa sallam. They said, yes, this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, are you? He said, yes, I am. He asked him a question. He said that, he said, the people of paradise don't urinate. They don't go to the bathroom. And they enjoy all these things. How come? Can you eat and drink without going to the bathroom? You'll die. You'll explode. <laughs> you see, how? You see, now, <laughs> you see how misconceived it raised? <laughs> what he was talking to? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. What was the response of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? Uh, anybody who was here last time, last year? Who was here last year? I'll make you stand up in a minute if you don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> what was the response of Abdullah Masood? I said it last year. I remember saying it here. And I was traveling immediately after the lecture. I still remember that time. This is why if you didn't raise your hands, there is somebody else who didn't raise his hand. But he realized that he will be put in the spot. So do you remember what Abdullah Masood said? He said, how about the baby, the uterus, in his mother's womb? Where do they get oxygen? How do they get rid of? <coughs> if you would explain to him that Allah said, the Prophet وسلم, said, the people of paradise will eat and drink and enjoy, and they don't go to the bathroom and become like ish. Sweat, sweat that smells like musk. He would not believe in that because he didn't believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you cannot explain to them with the, what they think is unbelievable. You explain to them with something that they would. And this is why I think it's Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu said, خاطب الناس على قدري قولي أتريدون أن يكذب الله رسوله? I mean, discuss with people on the, based on the level of their understanding and the level of their understanding. So Abdullah Masood responded in a very logical way, and that man had to accept, had to accept, just like Brother Yahya when he said to the man, if 1.6 billion people were terrorists, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's true. Uh, you have other examples? When he destroyed the idols. And he said, Is'alu. He, he destroyed all the idols and hanged the axe on one of the necks of these uh, big, uh, call them giant <laughs> uh, idols. And he said, he did it. He said, no, he couldn't. You're playing jokes with us. You make fun of us. He said, how would you worship? You see? You see? You see? Sometimes you explain the obvious. You explain the People who have misconceptions, they're veiled. They don't see reality. You've got to clarify. They're wearing very dark glasses. The sun is there. And they think they're wearing sunglasses. And not wearing sunglasses. They're wearing... I don't call them. Spectacles. I mean, fully black spectacles. Okay, that they cannot see anything. Uh, some these misconceptions, they could be deep into the belief of people. And they could be very superficial. They could be difficult to deal with. That there is no answer to them, 
And we've got to realize that, that we are human beings, we have a limit. And most, 99% of them, are very simple. Are very simple. Because people don't go deep into searching about things. They just take information as they get misinformed about it. Okay? Uh, let's go to scientific findings. Sometimes, uh, you know what, uh, Maurice Bocard? French, uh, French uh, scientist who spoke about his book was titled the Torah, Injil, and Quran and science and science and he 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 actually I don't know if he became Muslim or not but he was really amazed was, this is an amazing book that was written by a non-Muslim scientist a very well-known scientist about the findings of the Quran. Now, alhamdulillah, we have a commission in the Muslim World League where they do a lot of research on scientific. Do we need, as Muslims, to look for scientific evidence that the Quran is true? Or the Sunnah Prophet Muhammad is true? No. But now, there are scientific explanations that many Muslims will benefit from and will even strengthen the faith of many Muslims. Many Muslims. Uh, can you come up with an example? Is there anybody from the College of Medicine here? The College of Medicine? Okay, nobody? Strange. Usually you used to have many. Okay. Uh, you want to say something, Dr. Uh, Brother Omar? Yes, please. Uh, there is one verse in Surah وأنزلنا الحديد فيه بأس شديد. They discovered that iron is not part of Earth. It came through comets and other things that come to to Earth. I mean, this is an established fact nowadays. It's an established fact. And there is somebody whose name is, uh, I think, Keith Moore. Was it Keith Moore? The developing human. He talked about the embryos, okay? Uh, and there is a nice video, an interview that he had in Canada when he came here a long time ago. There was the first conference on scientific miracles of the Quran and the Sunnah. And he speak, spoke about the development of the embryo, the okay? The embryo, and how it develops to become in a form of human being. For a long time, before ultrasound, CT scan, which I don't okay, they had the belief, the scientists, the belief that we had a miniature human being in the form of a human being that we cannot see, that develops to become a baby. A baby. Is that, that true? Do you accept that now? Nobody accepts that. Because the Prophet said, the hadith, who remembers the hadith? Nutfa al alaqa yujma'u khalquhu. Nutfa yujma'u arba'ina yawman. Nutfa alaqa. Hadith al ma'ar ma'adhkar Allah. Okay? So, this is the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that talked about the development of the human being. When this hadith was recited to Keith Moore, he was really astonished. He said, Where did you get this information? They went to the book of Bukhari, he said, 1400 years ago, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, spoke in details about the development of the embryo. He was astonished. Then he went to Canada, I want you to listen, see how misconceptions really infiltrate into the minds of people. And he had an interview, an interview with an, 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 a Canadian channel, and they said to him, you, you claim and now this book is taught, in, he, he has a book titled The Developing Human. It's taught in all colleges of medicine, even here. 
With the addition of Sheikh Zindani to it, it talks about the hadith of Prophet Muhammad So what happened? Allah Nabi this makana khu Yahya until he comes back. So Allahumma salli ala Rasulullah. Teeth more about, spoke about himself in this regard. And I think it's in video. It's, it's available. If you go and look for it. Uh, the interviewer asked him, said, you claim that Muhammad discovered long time ago what you biologists are talking about nowadays. I said, yes, in very minute details. The misconceptions really lead to something interesting. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. He said, how he did it? I said, no. He claims that he got revelation from, from God. He said, I think those savage Arabs cut their women's I mean, wombs and look into them. So they looked at the development. The man started laughing. Oh, an old man. I, I think he died. An old man. And he was about to fall from his chair. And he, in such a situation, he don't really laugh in such a way, a hysteric way. He couldn't stop. He said, I'm sorry. But I couldn't really stop laughing. You know why he was <coughs> laughing? Why was he laughing? It is impossible to be seen by the naked eye. Even if you cut the womb of millions of women, you will not see that. And this is a scientist spoken to an ignorant, ignorant human being. How can you? You cannot see it with naked eye if it exists there. How about if you do this kind of surgical work that he was talking about? So there is a lot sometimes that we need. Now our world has become very complicated, brothers and sisters. And da'wah has become very complicated. It could be very simple, but sometimes get very sophisticated. Get very sophisticated based on the misconceptions that you need to look into. Most of these conceptions are not raised by ordinary human beings. Most misconceptions that Brother Yahya was talking about, that Arabs do this, Arabs do that, Muslims do this, eat like this, Muslim women do that. But they, they, something which is more cultural than to be related to religion. Because this is what people are really interested in. Unfortunately, the, the whole world has become superficial. People think about that they wear, what they eat, what they enjoy, that's all. Very few care about uh, real issues. Very few, even among Muslims, unfortunately. Nowadays, what kind of car you have, what kind of carpet you have at your home, what kind of earrings that you're wearing, what kind of watch you're wearing, what kind of glasses. Something that we've got to really focus on, uh, which is getting evidence from people's way of life. What do we mean by that? I came to Tabla Rasa, I didn't bring my books today. And, uh, uh, probably ha an hour and a half an hour, I'll give it the flash memory to somebody because my flash memory was destroyed by somebody. I am that somebody. <laughs> uh, but subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped me at the last moment that one of my brothers, uh, when I was in the Khamis Center, because we were there, uh, showed me this uh, file that he was keeping. I said, this is what I've been looking for. Alhamdulillah. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Wallahi, just believe in that, brothers and sisters. Seriously. And Allah will find ways for you. Have full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not let you down. Wallahi, I thought before coming here that I will speak just from memory. I wouldn't have my, because the, my flash memory was having a problem. So what do we mean by evidence? And we talk about evidence of refuting misconceptions from people's way of life. يا جماعة خمسين رجال وعشرين مرة ما يعرفون يقولوا كلمة اتقوا الله كلكم أعلم مني والله كلكم خير مني I'm just orchestrating 
Yes, brother, you're from Ghana, brother? Ethiopia. You're a Romo or? A Romo? Afar. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to begin with one problem. Man reports and God is both. In this life, we see people, uh, they plant many plants. They do, they do have many plants. But some, sometimes they can't keep up for me. Before they reach their, their goal, we see they are failing. So everything is under the... Under the Control hand. of Allah. You're right. Let's go get evidence from people's way of life. Taban Yaqwan, they say, why Muslim women are wearing hijab? This is, you are restricting their own freedom. Are we restricting your freedom, sisters? Uh, the lowest raised rate of rape in the whole world is in this country. We're not claiming they're the best people. Wallahi, we're not really acting Islamically. Most of what we do is not Islamically, unfortunately. But with all that, you find the highest rape, rates of rape among women in the whole world in the so-called civilized countries where women having endless liberty. So what they have gained? What have they gained from their liberty? We talk about sexual harassment and you talk about all these things. So this is what I mean. You get evidence uh, from people. قبل فترة ترجم عندي مقال كان باللغة الإنجليزية ونزل في مجلة البيان اسمها أمريكا تدعو للحشمة. حد قرأ المقال هذا ولا شافه؟ ما حد ضربك. لكن مقال جميل. If you just enter that, go to the net and you say أمريكا تدعو للحشمة. I talked about a lot of statistics. Okay, it was published in the University of Islam long time ago, but somebody, يعني أخواني مثلكم, يعني they asked me to 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 write rewrite that into Arabic, so I wrote it into Arabic, and I named it أمريكا تدعو إلى الحشمة. أمريكا, they're calling for حشمة nowadays because of the problems. What else? Uh, I watched a video film, and you could just, it's published by, it was produced by PBS, Public Broadcasting Service. This is a very well-known, respected uh, media. Uh, it is, it's non-governmental, it is public a center. They had a video film called Islam in America. Islam in America, very interesting one. It was given to me by a colleague of mine, Jazakallah Khair, Dr. Rahman Bangura. Okay, I have a copy of that video. And in that video, they talked about they went into prisons. And they went into maximum security prisons. Mean serial killers. And they have killed many people. And if you send them out, they'll start killing more people. You bring them back to the prison, they kill in the prison. They go out of the prison. You don't know what to deal with them. I mean it. I mean it. For they wanted to them, and they say, and I remember getting the first news, you know, Dan Rather, you remember Dan Rather? Samatul Dan Rather? You remember Dan Rather, Yahya? He works in CBS, isn't it? Chief announcer in CBS. And in six o'clock news, I still remember that, Allah, that incident. And that was about 20 years ago. Uh, he was I mean, he, he was one of the top announcers in the United States, CBS. But he talked about, he said statistics are reversed in Philadelphia. The vast majority of serial killers in these prisons end up back in these prisons unless they become Muslims. Subhanallah. 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 وَمَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ Even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had no idea about revelation. He had no idea about Allah. He had no idea about Quran before revelation came to him. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him nur and guidance for creation. So there is a lot. And that film detailed information about maximum security prisons and how those people who become Muslims in prison, how they behave outside the prison, and they speak what changed their lives, about what changed their lives. There is a lot that we can talk about from people's way of life. And 
Life has become God to people. When you speak about their lives, they listen to you more, especially than Muslims, because they don't believe in Allah. Uh, talking about religion in most Western societies has become uh, not fashion, against fashion. Huh? Not old fashion only. A taboo. Say, please don't talk about my wife. <laughs> I'm talking about Christianity. Say, I don't talk about religion, please. I'm not interested. <coughs> Most people have reached that level regarding this belief that they don't even want to talk about religion. Well, they have a one your responsibility. The responsibility of people who call for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very big. It's not enjoyment that you come here and listen to some people talking about Islam, their experiences. Probably you have more knowledge than us. But it's not the knowledge that we have. It is the work that we, we do. Satan probably has more knowledge than all of us. Did that knowledge help him? No. So we need to find ways as we listen to what's going on. How can I improve myself to work for the sake of Allah? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَيْ لَلَّهِ وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَا حَلْتَامَ فِي اللَّيْلِ بَسْطُونُ وَالْجَوُ الدَّافِي وَالْمَدْرِشُ وَالْأَخَوَاتِ فِي الْعَصْرِيَةِ No, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيْ all of us can be very good dads. If we take the initiative and we take the responsibility that, hey, I am responsible. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And you look at many of our brothers, Ahmed Amin is an example, Yahya Maxwell is an example, and many of those people, as they know the truth, they were not born in Muslim families. They had very little knowledge about Islam. Even they had problem making ruku' and sujood because they were not used to it. They were not taken to the halaqa. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean it. But now they speak about Islam. They're very proud of it. Look at Yusuf Istis, a very old man. He could hardly move. And he's very enthusiastic when he talks about da'wah, about Islam. He has been one of the first enemies of Islam. But when he knew the truth, everything changed. He became very energetic in the way of, of da'wah. So I really encourage all of us, myself and you, to really benefit from the little that we get to get it into practice. Oh. So I think the adhan is Jazakumullah uh, khairan. I'm very pleased. I thank you for your time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this moment to gather us in paradise and guide us to the right path. Allahumma alimna anfa'ana anfa'ana bima alimtana. إنك علم قيم أنصر دينك كتابك من الصريح